read from 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verse 8 through to the end of the chapter. So let's begin there then, shall we? 2 Timothy and uh, chapter 1, reading from verse 8 through to verse 18. But our text will still be verse 7 of uh, chapter 1, okay? So 2 Timothy um, chapter 1, verse 8. Let's read from there then. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ before time began. But it has now been revealed to us by the appearing of our Saviour Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. This you know, that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. The Lord grant mercy to the household of Anisiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. So that's 2 Timothy 1, verses 8 through to 18. <clears throat> and our text is 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love, and of a sound mind. So let's ask God then to, to bless us as we turn to his word. Heavenly Father, we thank you then that we are here on a Sunday evening meeting by a Zoom. And Lord, in many ways, this uh, way of communicating reminds us of spiritual realities, that we are joined by the Holy Spirit. And uh, as a result, we are one. Uh, we have one bond of peace and uh, we are brought to one faith and one hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we thank you, our God, that we are here. We thank you for this opportunity that we have of thinking about your word. And uh, we ask your blessing as we meet together. So, Lord, we commend ourselves to you and uh, we ask you to open your word to us because our God, it's only you. Uh, in your grace, who can cause us to understand anything at all of the mysteries and the wonder that we find in the Bible. So we commend ourselves to you and we ask your blessing upon us in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, everyone. So we're going to think again this evening about verse 7 of 2 Timothy chapter 1. And that verse, do you remember, says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And our theme is the power of God. And we are th thinking about this theme on a Sunday morning, and we're going to think about it on a Wednesday evening. We are developing the theology of the power of God. And that is 
gives us a lot of scope to look at the theology uh, of the power of God, where we see the power of God on display. It's in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Uh, the power of God is in us uh, as believers, saving us and keeping us. So we're going to roll around the New Testament, hopefully, to develop this idea of the power of God. But I also want also to ground us, um, as we do that, in verse 7 of 2 Timothy chapter 1. So we'll come back to it again and again, I think, and just drive home the truth that Paul lays out for us in this verse, that God has not given to us a spirit of fear, but has given to us a spirit of power and love and of a sound mind. Now, as we look tonight at some practical steps, I want you to hold in mind a number of things. So I want you to hold in mind, first of all, that verse seven talks about a gift. God has not gifted us a spirit of fear, but has gifted us a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. So God is very much at the centre of what Paul tells us here in this verse. Uh, as Christians then, ministers in the case of uh, this letter, God has gifted a spirit of to his people. And just remember what Timothy was facing because we've always got to ground what we talk about you in Timothy's experience. So just a quick reminder about Timothy. Timothy was young, he was on his own, he was feeling very much isolated, he was physically unwell, do you remember? He had difficulties in the church of which he was the minister, he was separated from Paul. Paul was in prison, facing death, and Timothy was very much afraid that the same would happen to him. So he was fearing persecution, he was fearing imprisonment, and he was afraid of being killed. And those things are very understandable uh, fears that Timothy had. So he was facing a very difficult situation so much so that he was discouraged um, he was probably depressed he found it quite difficult to do his job and was on the point of giving up and walking away from the christian ministry so paul writes this epistle to remind him of what is true of him as a christian to remind him that he is prayed for by Paul himself, to remind him of, of his status as a minister, to remind him of his family, his mother and his grandmother, and the care they put in to his spiritual life. And all of this is to strengthen Timothy uh, as he faces this tricky situation. So keep in mind all of this there. Uh, as we now talk about some practical steps to help us rid ourselves of the spirit of fear. So before I do that, just one or two more things, if that's okay. I want you to turn to verse 7, then, of 2 Timothy and chapter 1, and just a few comments about the statement itself. So God has not gifted us a spirit of fear. Now, the first thing to notice is that Paul talks of a spirit of fear, but he doesn't then tell us what the fear itself is. It's the spirit of. So he's not tying it down to one thing. So Paul doesn't mention the spirit of um, health worries. He doesn't mention the spirit of uh, being afraid of 
arrest or imprisonment. He doesn't narrow it down to the spirit of fear of going to die. He doesn't do that. He leaves it very broad. And that's really important because each of us will have different experiences. And for all of us, there will be different things that could create the spirit of fear. It won't be the same for you as it is for me. And so therefore, Paul deliberately leaves this phrase open ended. And I want you to be very much aware of that, because you can quite easily make the mistake of thinking that this is about a specific thing. It's not. It's open ended. It's general. OK, that's the first thing. And the second thing is we have this phrase the spirit of. So it's very likely then that Paul isn't talking about one moment of anxiety. He's not talking about being anxious about one thing only. He's talking about a tendency. He's talking about something that has been with Timothy for some time. So it's really important that we understand that this spirit of is something that's a bit ongoing. It's a bit general. It's been around for a while. It's broad in its nature. It certainly isn't a moment of. It's probably in duration, about weeks, maybe months um, in, in mind. It's a very general and broad uh, spirit that Paul is saying. OK, so keep Timothy in mind. Keep the fact that it's open ended, this spirit of. But also remember that it's a spirit, a tendency, a general habit that, that is being described. And that's a lot to keep in mind. But I think it's important that we try to do so. If we don't, that's fine. But I'm saying that it's something that is helpful to try and hold on to in our thoughts. So first of all, what I want you to think about is the first practical step is the need to acknowledge that one has a spirit of fear. Now, you may say to me that you don't, and that's fine. I would think it's very unlikely. I think human beings are prone to a spirit of fear. And I think Christians particularly uh, are prone to a spirit of fear. And so I would say the first step is to acknowledge that one has been experiencing a spirit of fear. Now, don't forget, it could be of numerous things. It could be a, a, a more than one thing. It's been with you for some time, but I'm asking you to have the courage and the honesty to admit that, yes, this is something that I experience. It is an acknowledgement. Now, there's a tricky um, part to acknowledging because we have to separate the objective from the subjective. Now, what do I mean? So let's imagine Timothy there. He's got this spirit of fear. It's been with him for some time. It's build, built up, perhaps. It's something that's got more than one um, object for him to focus on. But you could easily say, well, Timothy, you, you've got a spirit of fear about being imprisoned, haven't you? And, and being martyred and being killed. Now, the tricky thing is this. In and of itself, being killed is a terrible thing. It could easily be for Timothy to say, well, look, wouldn't anybody feel like this? Isn't it a shocking thing to, to face perhaps um, being crucified or, or eaten by a lion? Isn't that a terrible thing? And yes, of course it is. It's a terrible thing. But the, the step of acknowledging is to acknowledge 
that there's something going on inside me that is more important, that is more significant. And it's the fact that inside me, I've got the spirit of fear. Now that is hugely important because as long as we keep saying, but this thing that I'm facing is a terrible thing, that's where the problem lies in this thing outside of me, that is going to stop us from getting rid of the fear which is there anyway. Now, this may not be clear, and it may need some further thought or discussion, but perhaps you get some sense of what I'm trying to say. You've got martyrdom in Timothy's case, but the spirit of fear was his internal workings. It was the anxiety inside of him that is the crucial thing. And that is what we need to acknowledge. And if we can acknowledge that the problem is this thing inside of me, this dread, this anxiety, this tension, this struggle that I've got inside of me, if I can acknowledge that, then that's the key to deliverance from the spirit of fear. So I want you to think about this in your own experience. And absolutely, you'll be facing things which in and of themselves are challenges. Of course you will, we all do. But can you think of somebody else who's faced exactly the same thing and they don't seem to be as concerned as you are? Now, why is that? And it's nothing to do with personality is to do with this, this tricky thing called the spirit of fear. It's, it's this thing that's inside me that wants me to run away, or this feeling inside that I want to avoid it, or, or the dread inside when I think about it, or this, this shrinking in my, my soul that I feel. I want to hide from it. I want to be left alone. I want to crawl into bed. I want to close the doors. That is what we need to acknowledge. Not that I'm going to face this thing in my life, but I'm acknowledging that inside of me, there is this, this anxiety. Now that is what I'm asking you to acknowledge. Okay, and that is the first step to getting rid of the spirit of fear. Now go back to Timothy. He was facing imprisonment. Paul was in prison. Paul had had the death sentence, but Paul did not have the spirit of fear. And that's not because he was braver than Timothy. It's not because he was more are spiritually minded. It's not because he was a better Christian. He didn't have stronger faith. None of those things. It was because of Paul's inner attitude to the fact that he had been sentenced to death. And I don't know if we will, but you can look into 2 Timothy and you can see Paul's attitude to the fact that his life was about to come to an end. Let's do that just for a second, okay? And you might get a sense of what I'm trying to say. So take a look at chapter four and verses six, seven, and eight. Now, as you listen to these verses, try and sense how Paul feels about the fact that he's going to be executed soon. Listen to him as he describes his approach to the fact that his life will soon be forfeit. 2 Timothy 4, verse 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, 
which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who are, have loved his appearing. Now, is there any fear in that statement? Any sense at all that Paul is shrinking away from it? Tense? Stressed? As he contemplates it? Any sense that he's inside of himself troubled and overwrought as he thinks about his departure? And of course the answer is no. So can you see it's not the thing itself that we face, it's not the experience itself that we go through, it's our attitude to it. And the spirit of fear is the attitude of anxiety about what it is that we are facing. And that's the first thing to acknowledge. And I would say for myself, this has been a big step for me in understanding what the spirit of fear is. So I'll give you another example, not from my life now, but many of us on a Sunday night before going to work, dread work. We dread going tomorrow to that workplace. And the fear is, that the idea is rather, that work is a terrible place to go. But it's that dread that is the spirit of fear. That wishing that Monday didn't come, that we could have a few more days off. That's the spirit of, and it's acknowledging that, okay? That is our first step. Now, I don't want to labour this anymore, but it's a crucial thing for us to grasp. If we are going to be rid of the spirit of fear, we need to acknowledge, therefore, that it's my insides that is the, the, the real issue here. It is my inner state. As I think about this thing, as I face this situation, it is this inner shrinking, tension, anxiety, that is what the spirit of fear is, and I need to acknowledge it. This is what I'm having. It is the spirit of fear, okay? So the first step is one of acknowledgement, and we need God's grace, and we need wisdom from God so that we can see this to be the case, and we can then acknowledge it. Okay. Now, the second st step is to admit. So to admit that I have the spirit of fear. Now, what, what's this about admitting? And I'm going to say something that's very obvious, implied by what we've said already, but I'm going to take it a step further. So the first thing is we have to admit it to ourselves. Now, this has already being hinted at by the word acknowledging. Okay? You can't acknowledge something without, I guess, admitting it to a certain degree. So to admit is to face oneself honestly and to say, this is true of me. I wish it wasn't. I wish I was braver. I wish I was whatever, whatever, whatever. But I'm going to admit to myself now that, that the problem's inside me. Okay? It's not with my, um, my bad heart, if you like. It's not with my work situation. It's me in, in myself. That's where the problem lies here. I hate this thing. I'm dreading it. I'm admitting that that's what's going on. I'm admitting that I have the spirit of fear. Now, the next step then, take it further. And what's really, really important is that we admit it to God. Quite simply come to God and to say to him, the one who is our heavenly father, I have the spirit of fear. And it might be focusing on work. It might be about my health. It might be about my family. It might be about my money. It might be about my future. But God, I have the spirit of fear 
around this thing. And I've had it for some time. And by admitting it to God, there's a huge sense in which that very act frees us from the spirit of fear. Because sometimes we have a very odd habit of trying to put our best face on before God. We certainly do it when we pray together. But I think my experience has told me that even uh, privately, sometimes we want to, to say the right thing or the best thing to God. Now, we know that that's a foolish thing to do, but it's still there. So to admit to God that this is true of us, this has been my experience, I felt it like, like it for a long time, admitting is hugely important. So I need to do it. I guess the idea is already there. I need to admit to myself. I certainly, absolutely, fundamentally need to admit this to God. Now, there's room, I think, for a, a, a conversation about, is it helpful to admit to one another? I don't know. It may be, it may not be. But I've put it there just for completion's sake, okay? It may be. Now, it's certainly the case that Timothy had told Paul. Now, whether Timothy had told Paul in the right way, we don't know. But there's, there's room, I think, for some thought about is it helpful to admit to one another? So the second step is to admit. The first is to acknowledge that this objective thing I'm facing, oh, it's really awful, it's really awful, bad, bad, bad. It's my spirit of, it's my thoughts about, it's my feelings around. That is what I'm acknowledging as the real problem here. And then I admit. Now, the third step is one of acceptance. And there's a number of things here to say about what do we mean by acceptance. And if I was to sum it up, acceptance is when we stop trying to get rid of all those feelings. We stop trying to push them out because we don't like them. It's when we stop trying to rationalize or excuse or explain or justify. It's when we stop that struggle to, to try and put up a case that what we are feeling is, is okay. It's that acceptance that I'm talking about. And, and it's a sense in which we've stopped the striving and, and the inner struggle that we've had around this thing, wishing and, and, and promising and, and all that that we get so caught up in. It's when we stop that, that we then are even further um, along the road of being freed from the spirit of fear. Okay? So acceptance, it's, it's, it's a sense in which we now find an end to that inner struggle that has marked us out for so long. So it might sound a bit scary to accept. I mean, let's face it, we can't change. We can't change what we are facing. We can't change what we are going through, can we? We have no power at all to alter circumstance or to alter providence. Um, Timothy can't suddenly uh, have a healthy stomach. He can't suddenly be married. He can't suddenly be free from persecution. So he can't change any of the things that he's facing, and neither can I, neither can you. We cannot change so much that is going on around us. So that's clear, but still we fight against it. Still we wish that it was different. We, we, we try to imagine what it would look like if we weren't in these situations. And it's certainly the case when it comes to things in the past and we wish they hadn't happened and we wish we hadn't said and we wish we hadn't done. But it's also the case, isn't it, for the present. So many things we wish 
that we had we didn't have or wasn't true or wasn't there or wasn't happening we wish now acceptance is the end to all that wishing it's 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 me letting go of all the thoughts that i have about if only if only this wasn't the case if only i didn't have to go there if only he wasn't like that if only this wasn't going on for me we stop that struggle and acceptance is the third step now these steps i think you may find it different in your own experience but i think these steps need to be followed in this order so you begin with acknowledgement and if you do if you are able to acknowledge that the real problem right now for you and me is the spirit of fear then i would really encourage you by saying that's a huge step really is it's wonderful if we can actually acknowledge that this is where my real problem lies it's inside me it's the dread that i'm feeling the tension that i'm experiencing this in 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 a turmoil if i can acknowledge that well done admitting then does come second i think and the the relief and the grace that is experienced by admitting to god that here is my struggle god it's right here inside my thoughts in my experiences in my in my emotions this is the struggle i got admitting it to god brings a huge sense of release and deliverance and then the third step I, and I guess, let me say again now, it's important to take these steps in this order. The third step is then to accept. So you're not spending any time now thinking, oh, if only this thing wasn't there, or if I only didn't have to face this thing. You stop that. There's an acceptance that, that this is or where we're at. This is in the providence of God what I've been called to experience. This is those things that he is working out together for good. And by bringing that sense of acceptance, really what we are doing is we are taking all our theology and we are bringing it to bear on this issue. All that we have learned, you know that, as we said this morning, that renewed mind that knows about the will of God and the purpose of God and the plans of God and the grace of God and Jesus, our high priest who prays for us, all that stuff that we know, we bring it to be and, and we have this third step of acceptance. So what I want you to do, if you've understood or not, okay, we can, we can, we can deal with that, but I want you to to try in your own experience these practical steps to help all of us move from a spirit of fear to one of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, we're not quite ready yet to take up these three phrases, power, love and soundness of mind. We're going to get there. We've got a bit of work to do first. And the way I see it, next Sunday, we need to do a bit of work, you call it preparatory work if you like, we need to do it around verse 12. So take a look at 2 Timothy 1 and verse 12. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. And this is where I think we'll go next Sunday. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. So don't forget now, this is still building the picture. Okay, so Timothy knows he's prayed for, he remembers who he is, 
and he remembers the grace that he's known in the past. Okay, he remembers all this stuff. Well, what you also need to think about then is what's the difference between knowing and believing? Okay, what would you say is the difference? Listen again to verse 12. I know who I have believed. So we believe and then we know that we believe. Okay, what does that mean? And then you've got believing and being persuaded. So what do you think is the difference between believing and being persuaded? So again, look at verse 12. I know whom I believe and I'm persuaded. So Paul seems to be talking here, doesn't he? In ways that cause us to think. We believe certain things. So what's knowing them then? And what's being persuaded about them then? And then we've got this, this wonderful final phrase at the end of verse 12. That he is able to keep what I've committed to him until that day. Now, the word able there is one of the New Testament power words. He has the power to keep, Jesus Christ. He has the power to keep what I have committed to him. Well, what's that then? What has Paul committed to Jesus? And, and what are you and I called to commit to Jesus, which the, he then has the power to keep through all the days until that final day that we have here in verse 12. So this is where I think we will be going next week. We'll wait and see because often things change, okay? But we're trying to get a, a big picture. And then once that big picture is in place, we'll then drill down to talk about how do we have the spirit of power? How do we have the spirit of love? And how do we have the spirit of a sound mind? Okay, so I hope that it, that is clear. But let me just recap on what we've done this evening then, okay? Practical steps, acknowledging that we've struggled with the spirit of fear, the, an attitude of, a prolonged period of uh, fear. So we acknowledge, we come particularly to God, to admit to God, and then that struggle, that, that fight against, is something then that we let go of okay these seem to me anyway to be some really helpful um ways to to bring ourselves from a spirit of fear let's pray then shall we having looked together at this word lord we thank you then that it is human experience to have a spirit of fear and lord we thank you for timothy and we thank you for how clear it is in his life and experience that he had this spirit. And we've got to know Timothy over the years, and we've thought about him on many occasions, and we've imagined this young man as a minister, uh, without a family to support him, facing a difficult congregation of older, more experienced Christian men and women who kn knew their Bibles better than he did, who left an, an argument more than he did, who would engage in uh, spiritual wrestling matches uh, with uh, Timothy, in which he felt he came off the worst. Lord, we have learned of Timothy with his physical illnesses. Lord, we have seen him feeling isolated. And uh, we've seen above all how he dreaded the idea of being persecuted for his faith, imprisoned and executed. And yet, our God, what Paul says to him is that none of these things in and of themselves are the problem. What the problem is, is the spirit of. And Lord, that's what we've tried to see tonight, that, the, that whatever we as individuals face, the problem is the spirit of it. 
And so, Lord, we need to be given grace and wisdom to see if that is our own experience. So, Lord, we ask for help. You know, you know better than we do if this is our experience, that the real problem lies in our attitude towards a thing rather than the thing itself. Lord, we commend ourselves, we commend others to you um, in our congregation um, who may be experiencing the same spirit of fear. So, Lord, we, co we commend this step to you. And then, our God, we've thought about admitting this. And so often it's so hard to admit to ourselves. It may be hard to admit to another. And it certainly seems very hard to admit to you that we have struggled with something. That, Lord, in our hearts and our thoughts, there is a fear there. So, Lord, we do admit to you then that this is often our experience around work, maybe. It may be around so many things. Lord, we, we have none of them specified for us. Uh, in the pages of the New Testament. But Lord, we come to you and we admit to you, you are God, you are our Heavenly Father. And then our God, we think about the fact that of the third step, which is acceptance. And uh, Lord, there is a struggle. We do wish things were different. We do spend a lot of time resisting uh, how things are. And uh, we spend a lot of time, our God, uh, shaking our fists at circumstance and hoping that things will change and be taken from us. Lord, show us this idea of, of acceptance. And Lord, may we know your grace then, so that we stop the struggle and the striving uh, that uh, you can see clearly. Uh, that takes place in the thoughts and the hearts of us, your people. So, Lord, we commend this to you, and uh, we thank you, our God, that what you have given as a gift is the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. And these are the things that we wish to know. We see this in Paul as he faced his, uh, his death uh, at the hands of the Roman Empire. Lord, how he sat uh, in his prison cell and said that he has finished the race, he has fought the good fight, and that he knows there is laid up for him a crown of righteousness. And not just for him, but for all who love his appearing. Lord, we thank you for the day that we have had there. And uh, we commend uh, what we've heard this morning and what we've heard this evening. And we've been asked about the, the couple who come this morning and last Sunday, and we pray for them. Uh, Anna and Luca, we pray that your blessing upon them, and we thank you that they have come uh, on two occasions.